Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for watching on this uh, wonderful sunny Sunday evening. Uh, my name is Erwin Maas. I'm an event curator at Studium Generale, Utrecht University's public platform for knowledge and reflection. And together with the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Utrecht University and the uh, Descartes Center, we've organized this special event. Um, Professor Fraser's lecture is part of the Utrecht Day of Philosophy, which was supposed to take place today. Uh, but due to uh, coronavirus measures, uh, we've had to postpone to uh, June 13. So if you want to know more about the event, if you want to attend, please go to our website, sk.uu.nl, and the tickets will be available soon. So um, before we start, let me just quickly tell you what we're going to do tonight. First, uh, Professor Fraser will be introduced by Joel Anderson. He's an associate professor at the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Utrecht University. Um, then uh, Professor Fraser will give her lecture, which will take about 45 or 50 minutes. And then after the lecture, we'll have a Q&A. So if you have any questions or remarks also during the lecture, uh, please leave them uh, in the YouTube chat. All right, um, let's start. Uh, I'd like to give the floor to Joel Anderson. Thank you, hello. Um, on behalf of the Ethics Institute and the Department of Philosophy and Religious, Stud Religious Studies and the Descartes Center, it's a great honor to introduce this year's keynote speaker for the Utrecht Dag van de Philosophie, Nancy Fraser. Uh, Nancy Fra Professor Fraser uh, is the Henry A. and Louise Loeb Professor of Political and Social Science and Professor of Philosophy at the New School for Social Research in New York City. She's written numerous books, including Unruly Practices, Scales of Justice, Adding Insult Injury, Feminism for the 99%, and Capitalism, A Conversation. She's a past president of the American Philosophical Association Eastern Division, and has been awarded the status of Chevalier of the French Legion of Honor. She is a rigorous and original philosopher, a gifted and pro prolific writer, a fierce and tireless advocate for social justice, a supportive mentor, and as we're about to hear, an inspiring speaker. But in the present context, I'd like to introduce her as a maverick critical theorist and a radical philosopher. As one of the key figures in the third generation of the Frankfurt School tradition of critical social theory, she combines a deep understanding of classical theorists such as Marx, Weber, and Polanyi with broad engagements with critical race theory, feminism, and a wide range of social science perspectives. In that context, she's been a maverick, blazing an independent and original path within the Frankfurt School tradition. Her early critique of Habermas's neglect of feminist insights has been hugely influential, and the same goes for her arguments for the need to rethink Westphalian assumptions about international justice. And at times in which critical theory has tended to focus on issues of recognition of culture and identity, she is consistently emphasized the importance of the analysis of economic foundations and issues of status inequality, even when they have been unfashionable. In all these senses, she's a real maverick. Incidentally, one of the things I learned as a student of Nancy's is the importance of paying close critical attention to the genealogy of words. So I looked up maverick. It turns out that this term is traced to a 19th century rancher who refused to brand his cattle and to his grandson, who in the 1930s was the only member of Congress from a Southern state to support federal anti-lynching legislation, defending it in a speech on the House floor. Professor Frazier is not only a maverick critical theorist, but also a radical philosopher. She applies her high standards of analytical and conceptual rigor to the examination of the roots of social injustice. What makes her thought so radical is the commitment to not just address the symptoms, but to pro probe the structural preconditions for surface phenomena. For Frazier, criticizing capitalism is not so much about accusing capitalists of wrongdoing, though she doesn't shy away from doing that. It's about exposing the ways in which so many social injustices are rooted in deeper structures of the distinctive form of society called capitalism. And hence her radical philosophy is about how social progress requires identifying rethinking and ultimately transforming the fundamental underlying structures presupposed by our capitalist form of society. In addition to all this, by combining high standards of philosophical rigor with personal warmth and a supportive collaborative attitude, she has inspired and mentored generations of feminists and critical theorists. 
at Northwestern University, the New School, and internationally as a participant in countless workshops and as a visiting researcher at prestigious research institutes. It is thus with gratitude as well as pleasure that I invite Nancy Frazier to deliver her keynote speech entitled Against the Environmentalism of the Rich. Nancy? Well, thank you so much, Joel, for that uh, really generous and, uh, and warm introduction. And, and above all, for that little bit about the word maverick, uh, I, um, I breathed a sigh of relief when you <laughs> explained that it had some respectable origins, because my first thought was, oh God, I don't want to be like Sarah Palin, who went around <laughs> claiming that she was a maverick. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm very happy to be here and, and grateful for the invitation to deliver this lecture. And I thank uh, Erwin and Joel and everybody else whose work um, behind the scenes is responsible for making this happen. So as Joel said, my, uh, the title of my lecture is Against the Environmentalism of the Rich. And I have a subtitle, What Capitalism's History Can Teach Us About Ecopolitics. Now, it turns out that my entire lecture is really nothing more but a gloss on that title. Uh, 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 just by simply explaining what I mean by that title, you'll get the whole gist of it. And the thing is, the title contains four terms that require some elaboration, namely ecopolitics, environmentalism of the rich, capitalism, and history. So I'm just going to go through those four one by one, beginning with ecopolitics. Now, that's my term, and I'm not the only one who uses it, by the way, but it's my term for the whole array of contemporary political perspectives and projects that include some kind of response to climate change, that treat global warming as real and as demanding action. By using this term ecopolitics, I want to stress that there are a, a very great range and variety of such orientations that are presently occupying our political landscape. For example, Let's uh, mention the young generation of activists epitomized by Greta Thunberg, who chastised their elders for stealing the future and demand immediate action to save the planet. Another example, movements for degrowth that pin the rap on consumerist lifestyles and propose to transform our ways of living. Another example, indigenous communities engaged in defending their habitats, livelihoods, and ways of life from invasion and corporate extractivism. Feminists who mobilize, who mobilize for forms of life that sustain reproduction, both social and ecological. Anti-racist activists who target environmental injustices. Social Democrats who militate for a Green New Deal. There are also right-wing populist eco-nationalists who want to preserve their own green spaces and natural resources by excluding others, immigrants, and so on. Then we have governments in the global south who are claiming a right to development, popular movements that advocate commoning or a solidarity and social economy, commercial interests that use neoliberal carbon offset schemes to enclose land, dispossess those who live from them, and capture new forms of monopoly rent. Finally, there are, is the broad range of corporate and financial interests who are profiting from speculation in eco-commodities and who aim above all to ensure that the global climate regime remains market-centered and capital-friendly. Now, the point of rattling off this list is to show that ecopolitics today is all over the map. It's a large and confused and contested field. It contains a multitude of perspectives that not only diverge, but even in many cases conflict. Now, I think that this field is still relatively open and unsettled. Nothing decisive will happen unless and until it gets organized. 
by which I mean until the mass of conflicting strands of eco opinion get resolved into a relatively clear set of opposing camps separated by a relatively clear fault line. So for me, the pressing question is, which perspectives will predominate? Which will succeed in wooing enough of the others to create what the Gramscians would call a hegemonic block in support of a shared project of eco-societal transformation? For reasons that I will soon explain, I think that the key to this uh, process is the question of capitalism. But first, I want to explain the phrase, the environmentalism of the rich. Now, I coined this expression by inverting Juan Martinez Allier's term, the environmentalism of the poor. That's a, a title of a great book that he published. Let's see, I don't know if I have it with me, but I'm guessing around 2005. Someone can check that. What Martinez Allier meant by the environmentalism of the poor was the struggles of poor communities, mainly but not only in the global South, that aimed at countering imperial and neo-imperial corporate assaults on their natural surroundings. But they didn't understand their natural surroundings as nature, capital N in the abstract, but rather as habitats, places uh, of living that were inextricably entwined with their ways of life, with their sources of livelihood, with their community and the, the social reproduction of their community and with their political and cultural identity. In other words, the environmentalism of the poor as Martinez Allier presented it was integrated. It was a politics that brought together a whole set of truly existential concerns Rather than separate out harms to non-human nature, this eco-politics treats those as deeply entangled with harms to human communities. Now, by contrast, what I'm calling the environmentalism of the rich is single issue environmentalism. Environmentalism as nature defense, capital N, capital D, a perspective that is, uh, purports to be uncontaminated by any other quote unquote extraneous concerns, concerns such as social justice, livelihood security, democracy, social reproduction of human communities. Now, why call that the environmentalism of the rich? My point is that those other apparently non-environmental concerns only appear to be extraneous to people whose livelihoods, political rights, and community survival are not existentially threatened. Just as single issue feminism can only be, in the end, a feminism for the 1%, so single issue environmentalism can only, in the end, be an environmentalism of the rich. In both cases, what purports to be an emancipatory movement actually represents the interests of a small elite and if pursued to the limit ends up harming the vast majority. I think you'll see why uh, it, uh, as I go on. Anyway, these two terms, the environmentalism of the rich and the environmentalism of the poor clearly form an opposing pair. They stand in opposition to one another. And this pair suggests one possible way of simplifying that very complex eco-political field I just referred to. In that case, the opposition between environmentalisms of the rich and the poor would become the paramount division, the central fault line around which the whole of eco-politics would be organized and in relation to which every eco-political perspective would have to situate itself. The key question for any eco-political movement then would be, which side are you on? To quote an old line. This brings me, of course, finally to capitalism. As they function in our context, these terms, rich and poor, are surrogates for class categories. 
Granted, they are quite simplified terms and they lack analytical precision, but they do serve to direct our attention to the overall social formation in which we live and die and in which eco-politics plays out. Now, equally important, capitalism, I'm going to try to convince you, is the social formation that has brought us global warming. Contra those who speak of anthropogenic climate change, the principal socio-historical agents of global warming is not humanity in general, but the small class of entrepreneurs who have engineered the system of production and transport that is bombarding the atmosphere with greenhouse gases. They have not done this contingently, I suggest, as a result of some freak accident or quirk of fate. Rather, they have been strongly incentivized to do so by a social system that gives them the means, motive, and opportunity to savage the planet. This goes to Joel's point about looking for the structural conditions behind uh, what might otherwise look to be like one-off individual actions. Okay, let me explain a little bit about capitalism as I understand it. Capitalist societies split off a realm of action, which they call the economy, from the latter's non-economic, or they define as non-economic, background conditions, including nature. And in doing so, they establish a contradictory relation between those two realms, between the economy and nature. On the one hand, the system's economy is constitutively dependent on so-called nature, both as a tap for production's inputs and as a sink for disposing its waste. On the other hand, capitalist society incentivizes owners bent on maximizing profits to commandeer what they think of as nature's gifts as cheaply as possible while absolving them of any obligation to replenish what they take or to repair what they damage. Put differently, capitalist societies devolve to capital or rather to those dedicated to its accumulation, let's call them the capitalist class, devolves to them the task of organizing production. It is the class of capitalists whom this system licenses to extract raw materials, generate energy, determine land use, engineer food systems, bioprospect medicinals, and dispose of waste, effectively ceding to them the lion's share of control over air and water, soil and minerals, flora and fauna, forests and oceans, atmosphere and climate, which is to say all the basic conditions of life on earth. Capitalist societies thus vest a class that is strongly motivated to trash nature with the power to manage our relations to it. More than a relation to labor then, capital is also a relation to nature, a predatory extractive relation, which consumes ever more biophysical wealth in order to pile up ever more profits. What also piles up not accidentally, is an ever-growing mountain of eco-wreckage, an atmosphere flooded by carbon emissions, climbing temperatures, crumbling polar ice shelves, rising seas clogged with islands of plastic, mass extinctions, declining biodiversity, climate-driven migrations of organisms and pathogens, and therefore, as we now know, increased zoonotic spillovers of deadly viruses, Superstorms, mega droughts, I could go on and on and on. You know uh, what I'm talking about. Systemically primed to free ride on a nature that cannot really self replenish without limit, capitalism's economy is always on the verge of destabilizing its own ecological conditions of possibility. What I'm arguing then is that there is an ecological contradiction lodged at the very heart of capitalist society in the relation the society establishes between economy and nature. The contradiction, in other words, is structural, built into the DNA 
of capitalist society. And that means that we cannot save the planet without disabling some core defining features of this social order. Ecopolitics, I conclude, must be anti-capitalist. Now that conclusion is fine and, and even powerful, I would say, as far as it goes, but it doesn't yet tell the whole story. We also need to consider some additional structural contradictions of capitalist society that also impact nature and the struggles around it. Let me first mention the social reproductive conditions for a capitalist economy. Here too, capitalism organizes more than production. In this case, production's relation to the multiple forms of care work performed by communities and families, chiefly, but not only by women. Sustaining the human beings who constitute labor and forging the social bonds that enable cooperation, care work is indispensable to any system of social provisioning. But capitalism's distinctive way of organizing it is every bit as contradictory as its way of organizing nature. Here too, the system works through splitting. In this case, splitting production off from reproduction treating the first alone as a locus of value and thereby licensing economy to free ride on society, to appropriate care work without replenishment, to deplete the energies needed to provide it, and thus to jeopardize an essential condition of its own possibility. So there's also then uh, above and beyond the ecological contradiction, a social reproductive contradiction lodged at the very heart of capitalist society. Now I want to suggest that this social reproductive contradiction is deeply entangled with nature and with the ecological contradiction because social reproduction is deeply concerned with matters of life and death. Care of children encompasses not only socialization, education, and emotional nurturance, but also gestation, birthing, postnatal tending to bodies, and ongoing physical protection. Care for the sick and dying is focused on healing bodies and easing pain, as well as on providing solace and assuring dignity. And everyone, young or old, sick or well, depends on care work to maintain shelter, nutrition, and sanitation for the sake both of physical well being and social connection. What I'm saying then is that social reproductive work aims to sustain beings who are simultaneously natural and cultural. It confounds that distinction. It manages the interface of sociality and biology, of community and habitat. Social reproduction, thus, is intimately entwined with ecological reproduction which is why so many crises of the first are also crises of the second, and why so many struggles over nature are also struggles over family, community, and ways of life. When capital destabilizes the ecosystems that support human habitats, it simultaneously jeopardizes caregiving, as well as the livelihoods and social relations that sustain it. And when people fight back, conversely, it is often to defend the entire eco-social nexus at a single stroke. Eco-critical theorists, of which I count myself one, should follow their example. We cannot adequately understand capitalism's ecological contradiction unless we think the latter together with its social reproductive contradiction. Although the system works to separate both nature and care from economy, it simultaneously sets in motion extensive interactions among them. Now I could make an exactly parallel analogous argument for uh, capitalism's so-called political contradiction, the way it splits the, the political from the economic and incentivizes economic actors to hollow out public power, um, a uh, very uh, 
harmful thing that we are experiencing now in the midst of COVID, uh, thanks to the depletion of the divestment from failure to invest in public health infrastructure over decades uh, under the uh, under the gun of so-called austerity uh, imposed by capital who didn't want to pay for it. But that's another story, and I'm going to skip that uh, for reasons of time. I want instead, though, to emphasize that the ecological is entangled, in addition, with capitalism's constitutive division between exploitation and expropriation. This division corresponds roughly to the global color line. It marks off populations whose social reproduction cost capital absorbs through the payment of wages from those whose wealth and labor it simply seizes, just takes without compensation. Whereas the first are positioned as free rights bearing citizens able to access at least some level of political protection, the second are constituted as dependent or unfree subjects, enslaved or colonized, unable to call on state protection and stripped of the means of self-defense. This distinction has always been central to capitalist development from the era of new world racialized chattel slavery to that of direct rule colonialism to post-colonial neo-imperialism and now to financialization and dispossession by debt. In each case, the expropriation of some has served as a disavowed enabling condition for the profitable exploitation of others. And that's not all. Expropriation has also served as a method by which capital accesses energy and raw materials very cheaply, if not for free. The system develops in part by annexing chunks of nature for whose reproduction costs it does not pay. In appropriating nature, however, capital simultaneously expropriates human communities, those for whom the confiscated material and befouled surroundings constitute a habitat, their means of livelihood, the material basis for their social reproduction. These communities thus bear a hugely disproportionate share of the global environmental load. Their expropriation affords other, dare we say, whiter communities the chance to be sheltered at least for a while from the worst effects of capital's cannibalization of nature. The system's built-in tendency to ecological crisis is therefore tightly linked to its built-in tendency to create racially marked populations for expropriation. In this case too, we can't understand the first without understanding the second and vice versa. So what I'm arguing here is that capitalism's ecological contradiction cannot be separated from the system's other constitutive irrationalities and injustices. To ignore the latter by adopting the reductive, let's call it ecologistic perspective of single issue environmentalism is to miss the distinctive institutional structure of capitalist society. Dividing economy not only from nature, but also from state care and racial imperial expropriation, this society institutes a tangle of mutually interacting contradictions that we need to be able to hold together, to think together in a single frame. So that's my, my short riff on capitalism, on capitalism in general, understood structurally as if, so to speak, out of time. But now I want to turn to history, to capitalism's history, and recall that's the fourth element of my lecture title. Now, as I understand it, this history unfolds across a series of four distinct periods, namely the mercantile capitalist phase of the 16th through 18th centuries, the liberal colonial regime of the 19th and early 20th, the state managed phase of the middle third of the 20th century, the so-called Trente de Glorieuse, 
and the current regime of financialized capitalism. In each of these phases, this economy nature relation that I just sketched in an abstract structural way has assumed a different guise as have the crisis phenomena generated by it. Each of these phases too has precipitated distinctive types of struggles over nature. But one thing has remained constant throughout. In each case, eco-crisis and eco-struggle have been deeply entwined with other strands of crisis and struggle, grounded in other structural contradictions of capitalist society. Consider first mercantile capitalism. In that phase, agriculture and manufacturing ran almost entirely on animal muscle, both human and non-human, like oxen and horses and so on. There was also some wind and water. And I know when I'm speaking to an audience in the Netherlands, I have to uh, mention uh, that. Uh, this meant that in earlier uh, eras, you are somewhat exceptional in the degree to which you've harnessed wind, it's true. Uh, but in, uh, what I'm saying is that in uh, the centrality of animal muscle is what, really what I'm focusing on in this regime. And this meant that as in earlier eras, the, the only or chief way to augment available energy was through conquest. Only by annexing land and commandeering additional supplies of labor could mercantile capitalist powers increase their forces of production. This they did with a vengeance in the so-called new world as well as in the so-called old. In the periphery, they installed brutal systems of socio-ecological extractivism from the silver mines of Potosi in Peru to the slave plantations of San Domingue. They worked land and labor to the point of exhaustion making no effort to replenish what they expended and leaving trails of environmental and social wreckage across whole continents. In the core, uh, the European heartland, let's say, they forcibly enclosed lands, dispossessing tenants and farmers of use rights in the commons, upending their form of life. In both cases, core and periphery, those on the receiving end fought back with varying degrees of success. Aimed at countering wholesale assaults on habitats, communities, and livelihoods, their resistance was necessarily integrative. Whether communalist, counter-imperial, or Republican, it combined what we would now call environmental struggles with struggles over labor, social reproduction, political power, and livelihood. Now, the liberal capitalist era, the next one, began in early 19th century England, which pioneered the world historic shift to fossil energy. The coal-fired steam engine opened the way to the world's first exosomatic regime, meaning the first to take carbonized solar energy from beneath the crust of the earth and to convert it to mechanical energy outside of living bodies. So we're no longer talking about animal muscle here. That's going on within living bodies. Tied only indirectly to biomass, the liberal colonial regime appeared to liberate the forces of production from the constraints of land and labor. But that was an appearance only, in fact, an illusion. In fact, exosomatic industrialization in Europe, North America, and Japan rested on a hidden abode of somatic-based extractivism in the periphery. What made Manchester's factories hum was the massive import of what Jason Moore calls cheap natures, wrested from colonized lands by masses of unfree and dependent labor, cheap cotton to feed the mills, cheap sugar, tobacco, coffee, and tea to stimulate the hands, cheap bird shit even to feed the soil that fed the workers. So the apparent savings of labor and land was actually a form of what some theorists are now calling environmental load displacement. That is a shift in the man, demands placed on biomass from core to periphery. Theorists and historians of eco-imperialism are only now reckoning the full extent of this cost shifting. <clears throat> 
while also revealing the close connection of anti-colonialism with what we could call proto-environmentalism. Rural struggles against liberal colonial predation were what Martinez Allier has called the environmentalisms of the poor. In the capitalist core, however, proto-environmentalism looked very different. The most celebrated version conjured a nature figured as sublime and beyond price, hence as demanding reverence and protection. Opposing extractivism, this perspective fed romantic conservative critiques of industrial society and eventually infused standalone environmentalisms of the rich, which focused on wilderness preservation. Often thought to exhaust the whole of proto-environmentalism in this era, it consisted in reality, as we're now rediscovering, with another perspective, which linked capital's assault on nature with class injustice. Key proponents of that perspective were William Morris, whose eco-socialism included a powerful aesthetic dimension, and Friedrich Engels, whose social environmentalism focused initially on industrialism's del deleterious impact on urban working class health, and later on what he called the dialectics of nature, or what we would now call co-evolutionism. Both of those thinkers seeded rich traditions of socialist ecology, which were subsequently obscured by narrow single issue understandings of environmentalism, but which are now being recovered and extended. And that's a very good thing. Now I'm coming to the third period uh, of state managed capitalism, during which a new global hegemon orchestrated a vast expansion in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, speaking of course of the United States, which supplanted Britain as the dominant superpower and which built a novel exosomatic industrial complex around the internal combustion engine and refined oil. At the same time, the US also gave rise to a powerful environmental movement. One current descended from the nature romanticism that I just mentioned, which originated in the 19th century, continued to center on wilderness protection through the creation of reserves and national parks, usually, uh, it turns out, by means of indigenous displacement. This environmentalism was progressive as opposed to backward looking. It was compensatory, aimed at enabling at least some Americans to escape industrial civilization, industrial civilization temporarily but it neither confronted the latter nor sought to transform it. As state-managed capitalism developed, however, it hatched another environmentalism which targeted the industrial nucleus of the regime. Galvanized by Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, this current pushed for state action to curtail corporate pollution. And the result was the founding of the Environmental Protection Agency in 1970 at the tail end of the state managed era, which was its last effort to defuse systemic crisis by internalizing externalities as the economists would say. It included of course the super fund, which was tasked with cleaning up toxic waste sites on US territory on capital's dime. Financed chiefly by taxes on the petroleum and chemical industries, the Superfund realized the principle of polluter pays through the coercive agency of the capitalist state. In contrast, this is important to current carbon trading schemes, which substitute the carrot for the stick and work through markets. However progressive in that respect, the state capitalist regulation of nature was built on more disavowed cost shifting. The regime unloaded eco externalities disproportionately onto communities, uh, poor communities, especially communities of color in its own territory, while it ramped up extractivism and environmental load displacement in the periphery. At the same time, it misframed its central issue of corporate pollution, positing the national territorial state as the relevant agent for eco-policy 
relevant unit. It failed to reckon seriously with the, the inherently transborder character of industrial emissions. And that oversight, we now know, uh, proved especially fateful with respect to greenhouse gases, whose effects are by definition planetary. All of these things continue on steroids today in the fourth and last period, the era of financialized capitalism, but on an altered basis. Relocation of manufacturing to the global south has scrambled the previous energic geography. Somatic and exosomatic formations now coexist side by side throughout Asia, Latin America, and some regions of Africa. The global north, meanwhile, increasingly specializes in the so-called post-material triad of IT services and finance. But here too, the appearance of liberation from nature is deeply misleading. Northern post-materialism rests upon Southern materialism, mining, agriculture, manufacturing, as well as on fracking and offshore drilling in its own backyard. Equally important, consumption in the global North is ever more carbon intensive. Witness steep rises in air travel, meat eating, cement paving, and overall material throughput. Under these conditions, the grammar of ecopolitics is shifting. As global warming has displaced chemical pollution as the central issue, so markets in emissions permits have supplanted coercive state power as the go-to regulatory mechanism. And the international has replaced the national as the favored arena of eco-governance. Environmental activism has altered accordingly. The wilderness protection current has greatly weakened and split with one branch gravitating to the green capitalist power center, the other to increasingly assertive movements for environmental justice. That latter rubric now encompasses a broad range of subaltern actors from Southern environmentalisms of the poor to Northern anti-racist to indigenous movements and feminist movements, uh, many of which overlap and are linked to one another in transnational networks. At the same time, state-focused projects, lately sidelined, are starting to reemerge with a new vigor as populist revolts, both left and right, have shattered belief in the magical properties of so-called free markets, some are returning to the view that national state power can serve as the principal vehicle of eco-societal reform. Consider, for example, eco-populist nationalists like Marine Le Pen, who has now has something she calls new ecology, on the one hand, and uh, on the other end of the spectrum, Green New Dealers on the other. Labor unions too, long committed to defending the occupational health and safety of their members, but wary of curbs on development, are now looking to green infrastructure projects to create jobs. And then again, at the other end of the spectrum, degrowth currents are finding new recruits among youth, attracted by their bold civilizational critique of spiraling material throughput and consumer lifestyles, and by the promise of buen vivir through veganism, commoning, or a social and solidary economy. Now, I've argued here for two chief propositions. First, that capitalism harbors a deep structural ecological contradiction that inclines it non-accidentally to environmental crisis. And second, that those dynamics are inextricably entwined with other non-environmental crisis tendencies and cannot be resolved in isolation from them. You could sum up my argument to this point by saying that an eco-politics capable of saving the planet must be anti-capitalist, and trans environmental. I think I've said enough about anti capitalism, but I want to say a word about trans environmentalism. The rationale here lies in the close connection that I've tried to demonstrate between ecological depredation and other forms of dysfunction, cum domination, 
inherent in capitalist society. I've indicated first some internal links between natural despoliation and racial imperial expropriation. Claims of terra nullius to the contrary, the chunks of nature that capital appropriates are virtually always the life conditions of some human group. Their habitat and meaning laden place of social interaction, their means of livelihood and material basis of social reproduction. Moreover, the human groups in question are virtually always those that have been stripped of the power to defend themselves, often those relegated to the wrong side of the global color line. This shows that ecological questions cannot be separated from questions of political power on the one hand, nor from those of racial oppression, imperial domination, and indigenous dispossession and genocide on the other hand. A similar proposition holds for social reproduction, which is closely imbricated, as I suggested, with natural reproduction. For most people, most of the time, ecosystemic damages add heavy stresses to the business of caregiving, social provision, the tending of bodies and psyches, occasionally stretching social bonds to the breaking point. In most cases too, the stresses bear down hardest on women who shoulder primary responsibility for the well-being of families and communities. But there are some important exceptions that prove the rule. These arise when power asymmetries enable some groups to offload the externalities onto others. This happened, in fact, in the era of state-managed capitalism, when wealthy northern welfare states financed more or less generous social supports in the homeland by intensifying offshore extractivism. In that case, a political dynamic linking domestic social democracy to foreign domination enabled a racialized gender trade-off of social reproduction for eco-depredation. We'll fund the first off the backs of the second. That, of course, is a bargain that capital's partisans have now rescinded by designing a new financialized regime that allows them to have it both ways. No wonder, then, that struggles over nature have been deeply entangled with struggles over labor, care, and political power in every phase of capitalist development. Nor that single-issue environmentalism is historically exceptional and politically problematic. Recall the shifting forms and definitions of environmental struggle that I've uh, discussed here. In the mercantile era, silver mining poisoned Peruvian lands and rivers while land enclosures destroyed English woodlands, prompting considerable pushback in both cases. But participants in these struggles did not separate protection of nature or habitat from defense of livelihoods, political autonomy, or social reproduction of their communities. They fought rather for all of those elements together and for the forms of life in which they were integrated. When nature defense did appear as a freestanding cause in the liberal colonial era, it was among those whose livelihoods, communities, and political rights were not existentially threatened. Unencumbered by those other concerns, their standalone environmentalism was necessarily an environmentalism of the rich. As such, it contrasted starkly with contemporaneous social environmentalisms in the core and with anti-colonial environmentalisms in the periphery, both of which targeted intertwined harms to nature and humans, anticipating present day struggles for eco-socialism and environmental justice. But those movements were expunged from environmentalism's official history, which canonized the single issue definition. This broadened somewhat in the following era, as I suggested, of state-managed capitalism, as we got a current of environmentalism that urged deployment of capitalist state power against corporate polluters. What successes that regime achieved were due to its use of that power, while its failure stemmed from the refusal to reckon seriously with trans-environmental entanglements, 
with the inherently transterritorial ter character of emissions, with the force of homegrown environmental racism, with the power of capital to subvert regulation, with the limitations intrinsic to a focus on eco abuses, as opposed to the normal lawful workings of a fossil fueled consumerist economy. All those evasions are alive and well today, still wreaking havoc in the era of financialized capitalism. Especially problematic then and now is the guiding premise that the environment can be adequately protected without disturbing the institutional framework and structural dynamics of capitalist society. Will these failures be repeated today? Will our chances to save the planet be squandered by our failure to build an eco-politics that is trans-environmental and anti-capitalist? Time will tell. But what is needed is a clear and convincing perspective that con connects all of our present woes, ecological and otherwise, to one and the same social system and through that to one another. I've been insisting here that that system has a name, capitalist society. To name that system and to conceive it as I have here is to supply another piece, an important piece of the counter hegemonic puzzle we need to solve. That piece can help us align the others to disclose their likely tensions and potential synergies to clarify where they have come from, where they might go together. Anti-capitalism, I think, is the piece that gives political direction and critical force to trans-environmentalism. If the latter opens eco-politics to the larger world, the former trains its focus on the main enemy. Anti-capitalism, in other words, is what draws that line I spoke about earlier in eco-politics, the line that is necessary to every historical block, the line between us and them. Unmasking carbon trading as the scam that it is, it pushes every potentially emancipatory current of eco-politics to publicly disaffiliate from green capitalism. It pushes each current too to pay heed to its own Achilles heel its inclination to avoid confronting capital, whether as in the case of degrowth by pursuing a delinking, which in the end must be illusory, or as in the case of the uh, Green New Deal by pursuing a class compromise that can only be lopsided and in the end not green, or by pursuing in the case of environmental justice movements what must end up in tragedy by pursuing parity in extreme vulnerability. By insisting on their common enemy, the anti-capitalist piece of the puzzle indicates a path that partisans of degrowth, environmental justice, and a Green New Deal can travel together. And those, I think, are the most promising of the huge morass of eco-political currents that I mentioned. It remains to be seen whether any destination will be reached or whether any ecological destination will be reached or whether the earth will continue to heat to boiling point. But our best hope for avoiding the latter fate is to build a counter hegemonic block that is trans-environmental and anti-capitalist. Where exactly such a block would take us, where it to succeed remains obscure. But if I had to give the destination a name, I'd opt for eco-socialism. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Fraser, for this uh, for this very powerful uh, talk. Let's let's move on to the uh, Q and A. Um, a few questions already came in, and if you still want to ask your question, please please do. Please don't be shy. Um, there was also a, a, a compliment uh, coming in, uh, Professor Frazy, Fraser, by uh, Mark Graetz, who said, I suggest the whole lecture of Professor Fraser uh, be putting text online and, if unavoidable, on paper. 
she's given so many powerful insights and arguments that this should be shareable. So um, have you already um, wrote an article about this particular topic? Unmute, okay. Yeah. Um, I have um, very recently published a, a, a bigger uh, and more scholarly version of a lot of these ideas in the current issue of New Left Review under the title Climates of Capital. Right. And you can find that on the NLR website. Um, the lecture, uh, I could, um, uh, I do have a, a typescript and, but you know, I, I'm not sure that it, it adds that much. It's, it's pared down and zeroes in on the sort of social struggle aspect right. of the thing. Uh, so I think you'll find anything you want in the NLR article. Yeah, maybe my colleague Niels can can share the link in the in the chat to that new uh, left review article. Um, Mark also has a question: um, Provoking change in investors or CEOs will only work when they can be convinced that they can change their strategy without losing lots of money. Uh, do you have arguments I can use when talking to CEOs? <laughs> yeah. Well, as you can sort of tell from. Uh... The lecture. Um, they're not my primary audience. And um, I think I'd, I'd, I think I would, I'm not the, uh, the best person to, to talk to people like that. Uh, so I, I, and frankly, I mean, I, I'm not sure it's really worth the trouble. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have too much uh, hope of uh, convincing uh, them. Um, I think what will convince them is building the kind of powerful movement uh, that I've, you know, tried to describe a little bit here. Um, uh, I mean, Keynes wrote about the, uh, the euthanasia of the, the Rentier class. I think we're going to need something like the euthanasia of the uh, extractivist class. Um, and um, Maybe they can figure out a way to euthanize themselves and still play a productive role in society. I'm not sure. Um, a question from uh, Raoul de Lange. How do I have to assess the managerial class in capital's exploitation of labor, society, and nature? This class is made complicit, works to further the capitalist cause, but is itself exploited. Yeah. Um... Yeah, the, we can broaden it to talk about the professional managerial stratum. Um, you know, I think it's useful to think about the one percent and the and the ten percent. Um, basically, um, the if we leave aside the the sort of um, the super rich, I mean, this is populist language, but anyway, we leave aside the uh, the, the one percent. Then we do have this important stratum. And I suppose that I myself, I don't think I'm in the top 10%, but I belong to, to uh, the, the lower echelons of it, uh, of, of people who have, you know, secure, well-paid uh, professional jobs, who uh, have good retirement benefits, and therefore have a lot of investment in the stock market, which is going up, 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 up. Um, and um, who, in a sense, very much uh, have a stake in the system. Yet it is also true um, that uh, we're not the primary architects of this system or its primary beneficiaries. Um, so in, importantly, this is a stratum that includes certainly not all, but um, some, I don't know what the percentage would be, but some sizable percentage of those who are professional intellectuals, right? As I am, as I'm, maybe some of you are. And um, so there's always this in interesting question of the intellectuals as a, they're not exactly a class, but it's sometimes been spoken of as if they were a class. And they're very important. And where they go is very important. Um, now we have a whole uh, precariat of intellectuals. This is one of the features of financialized capitalism uh, with, you know, um, precarious adjunct labor, uh, self-employed um, freelancing bloggers and, and, and this and that. And, and they're not part of this 10% I'm talking about. 
they, they are people who thought they were going to become part of it, whose parents expected them to become part of it, many of them, but who have had their expectations uh, frustrated. So um, I feel that, that, that people who, who create language and, and, uh, and interpretation and, and so on uh, are, are important, that we have a, have a role to play here. And um, I would focus more on them than on the, the corporate honchos. Um, a question from uh, Laura Henderson. To what extent is populism uh, of a, glo a global leftist type a helpful tool for positioning capitalism as the enemy threatening lives and livelihood? That's a, uh, a very, uh, a really important question. And um, you could already see uh, maybe between the lines in, in my lecture that um, I, I, the, the, the environment, to call something environmental, the rich versus the environmental poor is to use a kind of populist language. I referred at one point to the 1% and the 99%. Uh, I wrote a book about that, but, or co-wrote a book about that, but that's also populist language. And it's not, um, in my view, adequate language from a social theoretical perspective. It's not analytically good enough, but it has tremendous mobilizing power um, we saw in the how um, the language that Occupy Wall Street created this one percent, ninety nine percent language, how how um, successful that language was in mobilizing th this uh, whole uh, huge upsurge of opposition to neoliberalism in the United States and elsewhere, and um, in the United States, famously, as you all know we got the sort of the battle of the two populisms, Trump versus Sanders, uh, both of which, uh, both of whom um, were sort of made possible by this Occupy upsurge and, and both of whom used the language of the rigged system, uh, which is another classic populist formulation uh, very, um, very well. I mean, from a technical point of view, at, at one level, you could say the system is rigged, uh, but to the degree that suggests there's somebody like the Wizard of Oz behind the screen pulling the strings, it's misleading. It kind of encourages you to, to, to go down the rabbit hole of conspiracy theorizing and find the string puller, and that's not a uh, productive way to go. So I think of populism, I mean, there's several questions here. I think of populism as a, at best, uh, as a, what the Trotskyists used to call transitional socialist program. It's a, 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 a rhetoric of uh, radicalization and mobilization, which by itself um, isn't uh, fully adequate but which in the course of, of struggle, which always involves learning, has the potential to develop into a, a, a more adequate, I would say socialist uh, way of thinking. That leaves um, aside the question of left-wing populism versus right-wing populism. That's ext an extremely important part of the story. And I'll, I'll just be very brief because I know there are other questions, but I would say that um, there are two, uh, it's, it's super important that we know how to differentiate these. If you start as I just did from the idea that we're not gonna just simply excoriate and reject all populism as demagogy, that's the liberal line, which is a very self-serving line. We're rational and they're all just a mom. That's not helpful. Um, if you're going to take uh, not a liberal, but let's say a Gramscian uh, view of populism, which is uh, which I would prefer, then it's imperative that you be able to distinguish left from right, that the populisms that have the chance to evolve in the socialist direction versus those uh, that go um, to dark, ugly places. And um, I th as I said, there, I, I think there are two um, key ways of drawing the distinction. Um, I would say, first of all, that, um, that left-wing uh, populism 
has a kind of tripartite structure. It, it imagines the society as having a, uh, a 1% or a, a, a predatory elite at the top. Uh, and uh, no, I'm sorry, I said this backwards. Um, I'm talking about right-wing populism, a tripartite structure. The predatory elite at, this, at the top, the freeloading underclass, equally predatory in its way at the bottom, and the virtuous people besieged on two sides in the middle. Whereas left-wing populism has a, uh, a, a two-part structure, the 1% versus the 99%. That's hugely important because it means that you're, um, you're getting closer to the idea of a, an expanded view of the working class, which includes immigrants, people of color, homemakers, uh, the expropriated as well as the exploited, right? Not the old factory uh, working class, but this broader view of the working class. Second uh, point would be that um, right-wing populism tends to characterize um, its enemies uh, in concrete particularistic identitarian terms, substantively. So, you know, the, the Jewish bankers, the Mexican rapists, right? It, it got this very concrete identitarian account of who they are. Left-wing populism, the 1%, it, it's kind of empty. <laughs> it's not telling you anything about what ethnic group we're talking about or anything like that. Um, it's at its best, it's talking about the functional role that a stratum of people plays. And that gets you closer to a class analysis. It's true though, that this left populist um, rhetoric can slide. So you can, you can, you know, you can end up uh, from the 1% to the, the Jewish, you know, international banking cabal. Um, and that means one has to be very vigilant about that kind of thing. Um, but I, just to conclude, I, I'm not a, an enemy of populism, but I'm not a populist. I think it's got some potential for what I wanna do. Thank you, uh, Professor Fraser. There's uh, lots of questions uh, coming in. A question from uh, Ingrid Rubens, um, and it's a question about priority. Um, given that we have nine years left in which major steps related to climate mitigations are, mitigation are needed, what would you recommend as the most important actions to take and who are the agents of change? Uh, well, first of all, hi, Ingrid. It's, I can't see you, but I'm glad to know that you're there. Um, yeah, um, I, I'm not really sure how to answer this because um, I think that that my idea is that people are where they are. They are experiencing the, the, the effects of this global catastrophe in specific situations and in specific forms. And I'm, I'm not for telling people, forget that you know this river is about to inundate your home and you know, go do something else. I think that people act where they act. So, uh, and, and, you know, and then and are often in, in, in desperate straits. For me, the focus is on connections. That's what I mean by resolving the eco-political mass of opinion into a clear map uh, of, as I say, the main enemy and so on. The idea is that, if, is that if, 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 if we had that kind of uh, diagnostic perspective, that clear sense of um, how the situation there and the situation there and there and there, which each, each population is fighting its, its, its desperate battle, but how they have a common enemy, how they um, are connected, and I think capitalism is the, is the key to that. Uh, so, I mean, sitting where I sit, that, that's my general answer. People will set their own priorities, but what they need to do uh, 
what I hope they would do is come to see their struggle as part of a broader anti-capitalist struggle in which they share a diagnosis and a project with others. Having said that, in general terms, I would say for my specific situation, um, well, even that, what I was going to say, but maybe it's not quite true anymore. I was going to say that the United States is the great Satan, in my view, and um, and that you know anything that could um, you know a, a kind of regime change in the United States would be a game changer for the whole world. The reason I hesitate now is that I have to factor in China as well. So maybe those are the two strategic points, but um, that doesn't mean that other people should stop doing what they're doing. Thanks. Um, a question from uh, Liefe Volkertsma. While I'm convinced that an intersectional approach would be more effective if implemented due to its rigor, is uh, the climate crisis not a case where we should accept whatever quick fix is achievable due to time? Well, um... I mean, that assumes that there is a, I mean, there are two questions. Is there a quick fix um, that does not involve disabling the dynamic of capital accumulation? I uh, doubt it. Well, I, I suppose if you had, you know, some sort of um, authoritarian uh, Leviathan, you know, okay. But I, no, I, <laughs> what, what, I don't think that we have a quick fix, uh, really, short of this very ambitious um, scenario I'm trying to sketch. And I think the only way to the um, to the to the scenario, and I agree with you that time is pressing. The only way to the scenario is to build this very big, powerful movement that integrates all the potentially emancipatory currents that are now dispersed and uh, you know, scattered and so on. Um, now, I agree that that has to be done fast. And all I can say um, about that is that um, for all of their um, horrendous impacts, crises, have a way of concentrating the mind that social learning speeds up in times of crisis. Uh, of course, so does, you know, idiocy speed up too. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, we're, it, this is not a normal time. So a year in this time is not the same as, you know, a year, I don't know, 30 years ago. Um, and the politics isn't, isn't linear. I, I, I left this out, but part of my view of the history of capitalism is that it, it's a, a set of regimes, four of which I described, um, which are punctuated by interregna, times of crisis where the regime has unraveled precisely because it was no longer able to contain and defuse these built-in crisis tendencies when the, the fixes uh, that a regime installs to deal with the crisis, the unraveling of its predecessor, when those new fixes unravel as well, then you're in a new interregnum. And I think that's what we're in now. Um, so, um, and this is the time where politics gets very intense, where all sorts of actors jump in to a kind of vacuum with out of the box ideas that were um, couldn't wouldn't have gotten a hearing while we were still in a phase of normal politics, and um, that this means that um, you know that uh, emancipatory as well as downright regressive radicalisms can get can get some traction, uh, and you also have the proponents of the uh, status quo ante who want to go back to that, who want to calm everyone down, send, send everyone home, and so on. So that's another way to sort of parse the, the grammar of, of the, the moment. 
anyway, I, I think that in situations like this, there, there, there is a, a speed up in politics and the thinking. Not guaranteed, no outcome is guaranteed. It's also possible that you just have a slow, the crisis doesn't get solved. No counter hegemony is established. Greenhouse gas emissions continue to, to flow uh, and things just slowly unwind and degrade. Um, that's a real possibility. Got a question from uh, Jay Vitorino. It's a question about uh, science and scientists. Uh, scientists and scientific publications often shy away to discuss class and other factors beyond very shallow liberal or so-called rational apolitical perspective. How can communities, uh, communities demand accountability from the scientific community as to bring more awareness to structural, ideological and economic factors behind the climate and capitalism's crisis? So um, I think I wanna ask this first by giving a shout out, a praise to climate scientists. I, 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 they are among my heroes, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the IPCC and all of the research and um, attempt to publicize and so on. Um, this is um, a, a major uh, human uh, accomplishment, which is um, not to say that science isn't at all ideological, um, but um, look, as, as someone uh, sitting in the, the US, where there's such an anti-science, anti-vax, anti-everything. Um, I, <laughs> I feel a, a need to defend science. So, um, but, but I would distinguish between uh, natural science and social science. And I, I would see my aim in what I'm doing as trying to, um, not myself, but, but, but sort of encourage a, as a collective project um, among critical social scientists and social theorists uh, to, to encourage us to try to do for the socio-historical drivers of climate change, what climate science has done for the biophysical side of climate change. We need both of these bodies of thought and we need our side to be as authoritative as theirs, which is not to say that we, we couldn't find things to criticize in both. And, and, and we wanna put them together. We want a, 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 uh, a, a, a critical theory of the socio-historical drivers of climate change along with, in tandem, working together with the um, with the climate science, that's how I would see it. A question from uh, Narita Roy Choudhury: Where does global trade fit within eco-socialism? I'm curious to know if eco-socialism leads us to a new kind of globalism, thinking globally and acting locally. You know, um, it's 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 hard to. Uh, it, it, I'm not in a position to sort of be very concrete about what eco-socialism is because it remains to be invented. Um, but I can tell you that I, um, it, it does have to be some kind of a multi-scalar, right, form of, uh, of, of, of society. In other words, um, so much of, uh, of the climate crisis and various other crises that we face, pandemics, which of course related to climate crisis. Uh, so much of these things can only be addressed at a global level. It requires global coordination. So I think there's no alternative to some form of global governance and, and coordination. However, I don't think that replaces lower level, right, uh, forms of co coordination and, uh, and governance. And, um, you know, I, uh, what, what we want, so I'm, I'm sort of a, 
it, it kind of depends what you're talking about. Um, I think there are good reasons to, to want um, to really encourage locavorism, um, but, but to want to encourage global vaccine production. It depends what we're talking about, right? These things are not the same. Um, and I would say that trade, um, you know, the, the, the huge issue, it, everything depends on transport. What's going to power transportation? How are we going to move stuff? How, how much trade, depending on what the, the carbon footprint of the transport is, how much trade uh, can we allow? And how much do we need to, you know, maybe I don't need to have blueberries all year round, much as I love them. Yeah. Thanks. Um, a question from uh, from Joel, Joel, Joel Anderson. Uh, suppose we grant that there is a need for new green technologies developments and their effective social implementation. This can quickly lead to a solutionism that plays into the capitalist framework that you've been criticizing. That said, what place do you see for technological advancements, for example, in terms of U UN rights to human development, which have been pushed particularly by the Global South? In particular, what are the implications of your diagnosis for promoting and coordinating the kind of technological innovation that is needed? Right. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I, the, the way that you pose the question, Joel, I very much appreciate because you already point at, at the sort of two-sided problem here. Um, uh, look, we have, um, we have uh, that, that um, those uh, one percenters with their extraordinary space cadet scenarios, you know, uh, planets and, or, um, you know, what do they call it? You know, where you drill the carbon down back into the core of the earth. I mean, they are there. So, I mean, this, this stuff is really crazy and really dangerous, right? Um, but that doesn't mean one should be kind of Luddite uh, with respect to technology. And um, to me, all of these questions have to do with who designs it, who gets to use it, what its carbon footprint is, um, what its, its social impacts are. Technology in the abstract doesn't say much, A apart from the mad schemes of the space cadets. We, we, that we can just, I think, dismiss out of hand. But, but otherwise, um, I think we, we want to know, um, uh, you know, the answers to these contextual questions. And I think that, uh, I will say one thing about eco-socialism is that many more questions of this sort, I think, in eco-socialism become political questions with a, a great deal of input from science scientific experts or technical experts, but there are a lot of trade-offs that, you know, we have to, to, to decide about, uh, especially in the immediate future, assuming that socialism might endure beyond the immediate, in the immediate future, we have such tremendous costs and repair work to do that there are a lot of hard choices to make. We might imagine some sort of a, a a later phase of um, abundance, not in terms of material throughput, but other forms of abundance in which the choices become a little less constrained. But for, for, for at the outset, they're, they're very, very constrained. And I think that they, they all have to be handled politically. Um, there was one other thing I was gonna say. Well, I, I've forgotten it, so let it go. Right. Um, so let's move on to the next question. Um, uh, I was wondering why you chose the term trans environmentalism instead of intersectional environmentalism or another term related to intersectionality. Yes, well, um, intersectionality is, um, I mean, 
it, that, it, that's the, I guess these terms are close. In the United States, and part of the problem here is that there are, we now are, um, we're past the point where we can give one definition of what intersectionality is because there are many different theories of intersectionality that don't uh, quite agree. But I would say the, the most uh, widely circulated theory um, has to do with um, the, um, the cross-cutting uh, axes of uh, injustice or domination, gender, race, class, sexuality, uh, cis, trans, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I mean something a little different from that. I mean, one way to put it is that that very mainstream paradigm of intersectionality is um, I'm, I'm politically on board with the program, but um, I think again, from a social theoretical point of view, what I'm interested in is where do those axes come from? What generates them? Intersectionality starts from them, for the most part, there are a few exceptions, starts from, from them and then says, we have to you know, reckon with their uh, cross-cutting effects and so on. Um, for the, the, the analysis of capitalism that um, I've been developing over the last several years, and I think you got some of it in this lecture, uh, is aimed at, at showing why gender asymmetry is built in to capitalism, why racial oppression and asymmetry is built into capitalism why political asymmetries are built into capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this is, I'm working at a different level. And um, what, I, what I took the force of the prefix trans here uh, to be was that instead of getting the idea that there's environmentalism here and there's feminism here and there's anti-racism there, and we want all of these to ally with one another, this language of allies. To me, that's the wrong picture. To me, the, the picture is that um, the entanglements are so deep, so constitutive that um, a proper feminism, uh, you know, I wrote this little manifesto with Chinzia Rutsa and Titi Bhattacharya, a proper feminism has to be from the get-go a feminism for the 99%. You could, I could have called this instead of environmental of the rich, I could have called it a, an environmentalism uh, of the 99%. It, it's the same, same idea as in the feminist manifesto. Um, I think we have room for two more questions. I have a question from uh, Carol Barty. I'd like to understand your position on state theory and feminism. Is it possible to decouple power and patriarchy from state institutions? It's a big question. Yeah. Um, state theory and feminism. Um, well, uh, I mean, again, for, for, I, I have to, the only way I can answer that question is to think capitalism as the framing concept in which, right, the, the, the capacities and limits of state power are anchored on the one hand and in which uh, gender asymmetry is anchored on the other hand. So in, in, in capitalist society, you will always have, I, I would say that, um, that the, the problem in capitalist society, this may not be the way you're thinking about this, Carol, but the, the problem in capitalist society is the um, pervasive hollowing out of public capacities by private capital, by mega corporations. And um, I prefer this phrase public capacities to state power, precisely because I don't think all public capacity has to take the form of right, a state-centric uh, apparatus. Um, 
And I would say that um, with respect to, um, to gender um, dominance and subordination, gender asymmetry, um, that, you know, that, that as long as we have a, a, a social system that institutionalizes this division between production and reproduction on a gendered basis, then that then gender asymmetry is going to be ramified in every realm. In other words, I don't believe that the state is male or anything like that. And there are feminists who believe that. I'm I'm, uh, but I do believe in a capitalist society which splits production from reproduction uh, in its various phases differently, but, but always in some way or another that you're gonna have gender asymmetry and that that is going to show up in uh, the political sphere and in every other sphere of life by definition. All right, we'll move on to the last question uh, by Clint Verdonschot. Um, we are wondering what makes a self-undermining process such as capitalism's treatment of the environment also a contradiction. One doesn't necessarily imply the other, right? Um, I would love to hear um, what, um, why you say that. To me, it does. Um, what, what I mean is that, um, that there are um, contradictory imperatives built into a system that uh, incline it to self-destabilize. And um, it's not a logical contradiction, of course. Maybe, I, I don't know what you mean by a contradiction. But it's a it's a, a, a social a societal contradiction, and um, my idea is that every um, every regime of accumulation within capitalism's history has to deal in one way or another with that e quote unquote ecological contradiction, just as it has to deal with the quote unquote social reproductive contradiction, the political contradiction, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I think as long as you have uh, the, the, the sort of basic uh, parameters of capitalism in place, that these contradictions don't get definitively resolved. They get continually displaced, diffused, finessed, circumvented, but only temporarily until the the sort of anomalies generated become, you know, so uh, so un, uh, so evident that people get fed up. By the way, I I that my my sense of this is a little bit different from one reading of Marx, and it's not even fair to Marx. I'm sorry I said that, but some, sometimes people think that to talk about the economic contradictions of, of capitalism is to um, say that it's gonna break down once and for all. I, I, I've never believed that that's what a social, societal contradiction means. Um, if, if anything is gonna break down once and for all, I guess the ecological is the closest to one that sort of has that uh, really epical, uh, and all be all character. Um, but even there, um, I think that the contradiction has to do with the, reg the regime's uh, loss of legitimacy, with the, right, the, uh, the sense that we're not gonna, of, of critical masses of people defecting in a sense, saying we're not gonna play the game in the terms that it's been written for us. We're not going to seek ameliorations within this, within these terms. We want to change the terms. So to me, the notion of interregnum, of crisis, of contradiction, these are all related and they, are, they have um, as much to do with, um, with the social responses of social actors as with systems breakdowns. We'll leave it at that. Um, I'm afraid we, uh, we have to uh, wrap up. 
Um, so please give uh, Professor Fraser a, a warm digital applause. Um, thank you so much for your uh, poignant and, and a very important talk. And uh, thank you for, for watching and your insightful questions. Um, we all hope to see you on, uh, on June 13th on the Utrecht Day of Philosophy. If you want to know more about that event, please go to our website, sg.uu.nl. Good night. Thank you.